I want to just take the next, uh, what we got today and two more Sundays prior to Christmas, and just take some of the Christmas story and talk about it a little bit. Um, the Christmas story is kind of, well, in America, I'm afraid that our Christmas theology is based more on Christmas songs than it is Scripture. And if you've been to some of our Christmas parties before when we've taken the little test just for, you know, for recreation, you know, we'll pass the tests out and uh, it'll, it'll be multiple choice. It'll be dealing with questions concerning the Christmas story. And when we go to grade the, the, the tests, Everyone gets almost every answer wrong. How many knows which test I'm talking about? And we go, what? And then I've had people, I told my wife, I had a guy get mad at me when we were having Christmas banquets up at the Fred Gilbert Center. I had a brother up there just get angry at me one night. He came and said, he said I am just so mad. There's steam coming out of my ears. I said, why? He said, because you're trying to tell me that everything I believe about the Christmas story is wrong. I said, I'm not trying to tell you anything. I just gave you a little test. We thought it was fun. It was, it was supposed to be funny. And yeah, there could be a lesson in there that we're discipled more by songs than we are Scripture. And I thought it was humorous myself, but it is a good object lesson to remind us how much of our theology is based on hand-me-downs, traditions, and hearsay, and how much of it's based on God. I, I love what we call theology. Theology is the study of God. It's the study of God. But in context, theology for us is studying about God, how God works, who God is, why He does what He's doing, what He's up to. So theology is the study of God. And I grew up in churches where, where preachers would get going and say, hey, I want you to know today, we don't need more theology. We need more neology. <laughs> and everybody would be up shaking their hankies and go, that's right, that's right. And I'm sitting there going, okay, I don't know. But later on, I'm having flashbacks and I'm going, that was wrong. That was wrong. In fact, if we get better theology, it'll completely radically change our neology. In fact, we'll stop praying about a lot of things and just start doing a lot of things. And it's, it'll change the world. Theology. Now... I am not a theologian, technically speaking. I'm just a, a humble pastor in southern West Virginia that loves theology. But the specialty area that I have fallen in love with is called systematic theology. Systematic theology has changed my life. Systematic theology is the study of God in His Word, where we take His Word and we start with Genesis 1-1 and we begin to look at God through the filter of systems. And we see that God is very reoccurring in how he does things and the things that he says. And what happens with systematic theology, when you, when you finish studying the Bible over several years, instead of seeing God trying to do a thousand different things a thousand different ways, what you end up with is God basically saying, there's only about, like five or six things I want to tell you that's really important. And I'm going to show it to you in such redundancy that you can't miss it. And he'll show you those things over and over and over again, like grace and like sovereignty, things like that, that that's just reoccurring pictures where God's just trying to tell you a few things hoping that you'll get it. Of course, we take it and we turn it into thousands of things and it gets very religious, it gets very formulized, and it just gets a mess and nobody really knows what they believe. No one really knows anything about God or what God's up to. We just got a, a big fat religion is all we end up with. But systematic theology teaches you how to take those things that God is trying to say with great redundancy and just try to get those simple messages of God. And the Christmas story has to be one of those case in points that when we look at it, we see that there's some reoccurring things taking place even just within the Christmas story itself. The, what we call the Christmas story is a slice of history that obviously is set apart. There is a covenant getting ready to change. God is getting ready to step into humanity. And he's getting ready to do something that will change creation forever. The single most important actions that will ever take place throughout history is getting ready to take place beginning with the Christmas story. But if the Christmas story doesn't go beyond what we read on Christmas cards and singing Christmas carols, then we may miss the reoccurring themes and what God is simply trying to tell us. I want to show you a familiar uh, place today in the Christmas story. Just a couple verses here. It's found in Luke and um, it's concerning the shepherds. And it's, it's, it's 
one of those most familiar parts in Luke that we read over and over about the shepherds. And it goes a little something like this. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news, Annette, good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Why is this passage so important? Because it's part of a trilogy in the Christmas story. And any time we see something that, that is redundant or is reoccurring, we know for a fact that is a specific detail that God is trying to hammer into us that the whole story relies on. And so we see here the theme of this story isn't just really that an angel shows up and the shepherds see him and go, wow, it's angels, how cool is that? No, we see that when God shows up through His messenger, the instant reaction to the shepherds was fear. God showed up and they were terrified. And the angel said, wait, whoa, don't be afraid. I didn't come to bring you bad news. How many of you guys know what it is to fear bad news? You're sitting by the phone. You're waiting by the mailbox. And you're waiting to have that meeting with somebody tomorrow morning. And you're just, you can't sleep. You're tossing and turning. You can't eat because you just know it's going to be bad news. And the angel says, no, don't be afraid. They understood this is a messenger of God. This is an ambassador of God. God has sent this being into our lives today. And they're freaking out. And the angel says, don't be afraid. I'm bringing you good news. This little story is the third part of a trilogy in the Christmas story. If we back up to part two of the trilogy, we find Mary, a young girl, 14, 15, maybe 16 years old, is going about her business one day when an angel, Gabriel, shows up. He says, hey, you, <laughs> who is highly favored. And she says, what? What? And the angel sees something in Mary and he instantly responds to it and he says, Don't be afraid. She recognizes it's an ambassador of God. God has stepped into her world and Gabriel sees her instant reaction is fear. He says, Don't be afraid. You're blessed. You're highly favored. Don't be afraid. If we back up to the first part of this trilogy, we step into a priest's life who's about to bear a child in an old age, him and his wife. And they've prayed and they've prayed and they've prayed for a child. And God has heard their cry. And so God sends an angel, Gabriel again, into Zachariah's life. And as soon as he shows up, Zachariah's like, what? What is this? Who are you? What are you doing here? The angel says, calm down. Don't be afraid. God has heard your prayer. So we see the whole Christmas story really starts with John because John prepares the way for the Messiah, Jesus, whom it's all about. And it starts with John's daddy, Zechariah, and the angel shows up. And John is afraid because God has just showed up into his life. And John, Zechariah is freaking out and, and the angel says, Don't be afraid, I'm here because God has heard your prayer. The angel shows up with Mary and she's freaking out because God has just stepped into her vicinity. And the angel says, don't be afraid. You are blessed. And we see the third story that the angel of God, God has stepped into the vicinity of the shepherds and they're scared to death. And the angel says, don't be afraid. I've brought you good news. And while man is freaking out, God's trying to say, wait a minute. I'm here because I've heard your prayers. I'm here because you're blessed. I'm here because you're highly favored. I'm here because I've got good news. It's all good. But man just freaks out and freaks out and freaks out. He's scared to death when God 
materializes in his world. The irony to this whole Christmas story is, is that man was sitting there waiting on God. Generation after generation rehearsing the stories of the prophets and, and the discussion of the coming Messiah. A people that had been abused and oppressed and suppressed and, and, and in slavery and bondage to everybody on the earth. And now under Roman rule, they are just getting antsy. When is God going to show up? The Messiah, they understand the Messiah is from God. In fact, the Messiah will be a form of God in the earth. They understood that clearly. The Messiah is coming to save us, to rescue us, and to make our lives much better. They're excited. They're giddy. That's most of their conversation around the, the meal table and, and around the marketplace. And They're waiting on God. They're needing God. They're wanting God. They are a very needy people. But as God begins to show up, instead of responding to answered prayers and responding to, to, to being blessed and highly favored, instead of uh, responding to good news with great joy, they respond to God showing up with great fear. Great fear. There was a huge dilemma at this juncture in Jewish history. Man clearly understood I need God. But something had happened 4,000 years earlier and it was complicated through the giving of the law. And now the spiritual side of man's mind was completely dead. The natural side said, we need God so bad in our lives. Our life is a wreck, man. They were even crying out, we need you, when are you coming? But the spiritual side of their mind had died when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit and now the law has compounded that. And now we find ourselves 4,000 years into history and in Jewish culture, man is completely trying to perceive God through the filter of of law. And the filter of law says things like, yeah, He's God. He's the great creator of the universe. Sure, He can do anything He wants. But He's pretty scary. Have you not heard your grandpa talking about some of the things God did? I mean, this guy, he sent fire from heaven. He opened up the earth. Man, he raised up enemies against Israel. Man, do not cross this God. Don't make him mad. And because of the, 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 the death of man's spiritual mind, and because of the filter of the law, while man needed God desperately, and even admitted, we need God, man was scared to death of God. God seemed very intimidating. The concept of God showing up, oh, we, we remember the stories of Moses, God showing up and, and you know, God's got a veil over Moses' face and, and, and God's turning around backwards and, you know, so you, no one can even look at God's face or he's going to die. Yeah, God is God, but you don't want to get too close to him. And this was the concept. God is intimidating. God is scary. God is unapproachable. And God is unrelatable to what's going on in my world. That's how God was seen. We need God, but don't get too close. And so the cry of man's heart was, God, come and save us. Come rescue us. Come and fix our broken lives. But please do it from a distance. Don't get too close to us.